Hello and welcome to the Armenian News Network Room Week in Review for April 14, 2024. Today we're talking to Benjamin Bogosian. Hello, Benjamin. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Benjamin. Hello, Aspet. Hello, Hovik. As always, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Hey, everyone. Before we get going here, let me remind you to support us to help us expand our reach. Go to our donate page, podcasts.groom.org slash donate, and consider buying us a coffee. Or better yet, become a sustaining member of Groom with a monthly contribution. We are going to keep going as we have for years, but we are stronger with your support than without. Podcasts.grung.org slash donate. Thank you and on with the show. Well, every week, Pashinyan seems to be pushing the envelope on narratives that challenge historical realities and the themes related to Armenian identity. This is done in a way that would put George Orwell to shame, in my opinion. So what did he do this week, you may ask? Well, First, he opened the week by giving a lecture to students, which he normally records and shares on TikTok nowadays, because apparently Facebook is not enough. And he essentially blamed the Russians or the Soviets for repatriating to Armenia descendants of the Armenian genocide. He argued that this basically tilted the political uh, discourse in the Soviet Republic towards genocide recognition. He further blames Russia for stoking the nascent movement to recognize the Armenian genocide in Soviet Armenia. All those things, essentially, the protests in the 1960s, the erection of the Armenian Genocide Memorial, were all apparently, according to Pashinyan, instigated by the KGB. Of course, during this entire time that he's talking about this, he doesn't actually use the term genocide a single time. Then, after Pashinyan opened the topic, civil contract members and their satellites started flooding the media with narratives meant to question the genocide as part of the official narrative that, you know, hey, we should stop pretending that we live in historic Armenian homeland and limit ourselves to recognizing that we only live in the Republic of Armenia, as if, you know, that has any sense to it. I'm not sure. But that's basically the the narrative that Pashinyan is pushing. Let's forget about historical Armenia and current Armenia has nothing to do with historical Armenia. And so in classic Orwellian manner, civil contract MP Andrani Kocharyan said that Armenia should work on establishing a detailed list of all victims of the Armenian genocide and record every single name of the 1.5 million victims. This seems like a good idea, right? Who wouldn't want to recognize each and every victim of the genocide? Let's forget for a minute that this government to this date refuses to publish the entire list of Armenians who gave their lives in the 44-day war. I mean, let's just put that aside for now. But again, all this is great, except that Andrani Kocharyan follows up by saying, if we don't record the precise name, address, and location of each of the 1.5 million victims, then this may give credence to the deniers of the genocide. Andranik Kocharyan's statement was received favorably by none other than Diaspora Commissioner Zare Sinanyan, who said that, you know, I really like what Andranik Kocharyan said. This is the beginning of a scientific approach to genocide recognition. Again, again apparently, to, according to Zare, nothing that was being done before was scientific. Benjamin, remind me where you got your education and if it was scientific or not. And also... Tell me what you think about the developments in terms of the, you know, what I've described so far and how the issue was brought up by Adani Kocharyan and interpreted by Zara Sinyanyan. What is problematic about this way of interpretation? Okay, thanks. Uh, I got my PhD in history, but uh, my postgraduate studies during the preparing of PhD was in the Armenian Genocide uh, Museum and the Institute of Armenian Genocide, Institute and Museum of Armenian Genocide, 2001-2004. Before I like uh, jumped from history to international relations, then geopolitics and etc. So the key problem of this discussion and uh, these ideas is the fact that you are telling that to create a real base for genocide recognition or create more robust or more solid base for genocide recognition or we're pushing forward the genocide recognition agenda, you need something. Regardless, something is to fix all the names, to fix all the photos, to fix whatever. But the first part of the sentence, to make solid base or robust base, it means that automatically you imply that as of now, as of April 2024, there is no solid base or there is a lack of solid base 
for genocide recognition or any discussion about Armenian genocide. And this is very dangerous because the base are not solid. They are like rock solid. They are ironclad. Based on numerous statements of International Association of Genocide Scholars, uh, hundreds of genocide scholars many times confirmed, reconfirmed that yes, what happened in 1915 there was an Armenian genocide. Yes, there was a debate like genocide was only 1915-1916. Armenian genocide was from 1915 until 1923, also covering the early ages of this Kemalist war for independence. There were debate about, okay, can we say the, the massacres of Armenians during Sultan Abdul Hamid in 1894-1896 were part of genocide or no, but the fact that there was an Armenian genocide, the base is ironclad, and it's a solid. And now, like, after 109 years of the genocide, after the more than 30 countries recognize the Armenian genocide, including almost all um, more or less relevant countries, at least in the, I mean, in the Western world and plus Russia, the United States, Russia, France, Italy, almost everyone recognize the fact. And even if you forget about political recognition, 99.9% of internationally recognized scholars of Armenian of genocide, they are telling that, yes, it was a genocide. There was an Armenian genocide. So why to start to say that, okay, look, we are not sure that the base is solid, the base is robust, and we need something. This itself is um, very weird. I will use yeah. the term weird. This is very, very weird. That was my question, actually. Why Why are they doing it? My understanding or my explanation, I cannot say my understanding because maybe they cannot answer that, but I would not exclude at least that this is a part of efforts to destroy any red flags which may irritate Turkey as a bull. Uh, because if uh, the discussions were underwear, by the way, there were discussions like a few months ago and still maybe, I believe they are continuous so not uh, too much widespread that, okay, we should change our constitution because our constitution is a red clause and we have bull Turkey and Azerbaijan, we are very weak and if these bulls, if they were get irritated, this will end very badly for Armenia. From this logic, I can assure you that claims of genocide that Turkey or Ottoman Empire committed the genocide against Armenians, it's much more bigger, wider red clause towards uh, Turkey than Armenian Constitution, uh, Declaration of Armenian Independence in 1990. So I again, I don't exclude, also I cannot confirm it or say that okay, this is 100% truth, but I cannot exclude that this is another attempt to get rid of anything which may irritate this bull Turkey which then may attack Armenia, and like uh, we all know that what happens if big, crazy, irritated bull attacks a uh, very weak animal or person or whatever. This is perhaps only, if not logical, because I'm not sure there is any logic here, but at least any reasonable explanation. Like why now, just only 10 days before the 109th anniversary of the Armenian genocide, Suddenly, Armenian government decided that maybe the basis for telling what happened was genocide are not enough, or we have lacked some basis, and we need to fix all names of this 1,500,000 victims of genocide, which apparently is simply impossible technically, because uh, let's not forget that we are speaking about Ottoman Empire early 20th century, when the bureaucracy, including the fixing of birth dates, people, etc., it was in much, much, much less sophisticated reliable. than even yeah. during reliable than even in, for example, in Eastern Europe during Second World War. But even uh, Israel, again, whose Holocaust took place approximately 30 years after, they, uh, the Jews are speaking about uh, 6 million deaths, and they put enormous efforts and worldwide, not only Israel, but Jewish organizations all over the world, including in the United States, they put huge efforts in the last 60, 70 years to fix or identify all names. But I believe they even failed to fix the 6 million names. But again, they were trying to fix the names in the Eastern European countries during the Second World War, when there was a much more reliable or accessible sources then about Armenians living in Ottoman Empire in early 20th century. So 
technically this is simply impossible to do like if you are telling that okay if we will not fix all the names of 1,500,000 big teams let's assume that okay we are fixing i don't know 1,200,000 names and we say okay because 300,000 missing the names are missing then uh, the then what? Then uh, we are doubt. There are doubts that this was a genocide. So technically, this is impossible. But politically, okay, academically, from academic or scientific point of view, for me, it makes a zero sense. But again, politically, the only reasonable explanation which I can give is that that okay, uh, genocide is much bigger red flag or red clothes irritating to Turkey. So if uh, you strongly believe that. You should destroy or burn all the red clothes or red flags which may irritate Turkey. Then somehow you should, if not outrightly deny the genocide, at least to start some sort of debate. Let's put it this way. Right. Obviously, you know, minimization of the uh, death toll is one of the attributes of genocide denial, and we definitely don't want to promulgate that viewpoint. Uh, but I think that we can't talk about what happened during the week without mentioning that it's just to me i mean i'm i'm dumbfounded still that our entire lives spent on learning about the armenian genocide and being an activist and trying to fight against denial now we have to worry about denial from the de facto leadership of armenia today just my own comment aspet do you have anything on this topic yeah sitting here in the diaspora i was actually wondering who died in the diaspora and made the republic of armenia as the sole proprietor of the definition of what happened to us as a genocide or not a genocide. Uh, who is going to say to me that uh, my grandparents who survived the genocide were not necessarily sole survivors, but they're survivors of um, families that got decimated? Who's going to tell me that was not a genocide? I mean, I understand that the Republic has a status as a Republic and a representation in the United Nations and all that stuff, but the diaspora is two-thirds of the nation and has a voice in this, and I don't think that there's any doubt that a lot of the scholarship that has happened in the diaspora has created part of the bedrock of scholarship. Yeah, as, before the show began, Aspet and I were arguing a lot about this a little bit, Aspet, and maybe we can continue this discussion. But it's interesting. To me, I would say, uh, you know, does diaspora speak with a single voice? Because after all, Zare Sinanyan is a representative of the diaspora. Obviously, he's not a genocide scholar, but he's representing this viewpoint, and some people follow him. Girard de Baridian is a proponent of supplicating the, the Turks. So in my opinion, if there is not a strong Armenian state that carries the torch for Armenians worldwide, then any other attempt to do this, whether it's through individual communities in Boston or LA or whatever, is going to be less effective. You know, So Turkey will always be able to find cowards. They will be always be able to find scum who are able to forget their entire history and the, their, you know, who are able to betray their own parents and their own grandparents and be able to diminish the legacy of the genocide. And uh, to me, that's the only way that we can do this is uh, unfortunately with a strong state. Yeah, and this is such a ridiculous discussion on the part of the government that I'm actually wondering if this is some kind of a red herring and they're trying to divert attention from other things, seriously. It's just ridiculous that we're talking about this right now. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's uh, turn our attention to the Armenia-Azerbaijani talks. Benjamin, 10 days ago, Pashinyan met with Antony Blinken and Ursula von der Leyen, and since then, the Armenian government's anti-Russian stance has continued. This week, Ararat Mirzoyan said that he would not attend a meeting of the CIS, continuing the government's trend to boycott meetings of Russian-led alliances like the CSTO and the Eurasian Economic Union. In Parliament, Pashinyan described the state of negotiations behind closed doors. All we know is that both opposition parties, Hayastan, Tashink, and Badivunem, said afterwards that their fears were confirmed that there are no real negotiations or border discussions. There are only efforts to manipulate the Armenian public to accept further capitulations for new Azeri demands. So can you summarize the current state of the Armenian-Azeri talks right now? Okay, since uh, September 2023, military takeover of Nagorno-Karabakh Republic by Azerbaijan and forced displacement of all Armenians from Nagorno-Karabakh, which 
definitely equals to ethnic cleansing. I may say that we do not have negotiations, we have imitation of negotiations. And imitation by Azerbaijan, and a very skillful imitation by Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is simply playing. He's playing with international community, and Azerbaijan is playing with Armenian government. Like immediately after September 2023, Azerbaijan effectively destroyed the Western platforms of negotiations. President Aliyev didn't go to Granada early October, to Brussels late October. Uh, foreign minister of Azerbaijan didn't uh, appear in Washington in mid-November 2023. Simultaneously, Azerbaijan approached the Armenian government telling that, okay, let's start bilateral talks and this will be successful. And to prove this in quote successful bilateral negotiations, even agreed to sign this December 7, 2023 agreement about the exchange of POWs or some of Armenian POWs, which came to uh, Armenia and two Azerbaijani soldiers. One of them, by the way, was uh, sentenced for killing an Armenian. They were sent to Azerbaijan. Armenia agreed that Baku should host COP29 in November 2024. But all these were part of imitation of negotiations. Then Azerbaijan put ultimatums to Armenia in early 2024, telling that, okay, give me these four villages or four areas immediately. Otherwise, I will probably start the war. Then to continue the game with the West and uh, not to fully destroy your relation with the West regarding Karabakh negotiations, Azerbaijan said that, okay, now I'm ready also to resume negotiations in Western platforms. And we saw uh, a meeting at Munich Security Conference. Then at the end of um, February, there was a meeting between ministers of foreign affairs. There were also some rumors that also on bilateral tracks, some meetings continued also in 2024. But as far as I understand, again, there is a no negotiations, there is an invitation of negotiations. While Azerbaijan has very clear strategy. Strategy number one, to weaken Armenia as soon as possible. This is their minimum goal. To weaken Armenia as soon as possible for the goal that if or when, not if but when, there will be new government in Armenia, Armenia should be weakened in such a point that any new government will not be able to somehow try to stop the process or at least to bring back some of the losses which Armenia faced since 2020. This is the minimum goal of Azerbaijan. Maximum goal of Azerbaijan, not only to weaken Armenia, but transform Armenia into some sort of client state of Azerbaijan and Turkey. Of course, this is not going to happen within months or within years. This is a much longer plan. It could take years or decades, but this is their plan maximum. However, both for plan minimum and for plan maximum, you do not need peace agreement. At least you do not need peace agreement in short and medium term. So Azerbaijan will continue this uh, playing games with international community, with Armenia, with Russia, telling Russians, okay, I'm ready to negotiate on Russian platform. Look, this is Armenia who he's against. But I'm sure that even if tomorrow Pashinyan will say, okay, I'm ready to go to Moscow and negotiate with President Aliyev, we will not have peace agreement. So this is the imitation of negotiations to weaken Armenia, to keep this no war, no peace situation, this gray zone, which allow Azerbaijan to escalate whenever it wants, at least when we are speaking about limited escalations. And the strategic goal is, again, to transform Armenia into client state of Azerbaijan and Turkey, and definitely to establish the land border between Azerbaijan and Turkey, and they can do that only by occupying part of Armenia. And by the way, these two goals are, they are not contradicting. Like if you are occupying southern or part of southern Armenia, cutting Armenia from Iran, you are automatically also transform Armenia into some sort of Turkey and Azerbaijanist client state. So uh, this is a situation. Everything else, meetings, statements, discussions, etc. Uh, this is like, uh, I would say, like good or not too much good theater, theater collections. So is the situation as dire as the two opposition parties are making it out to be? I believe yes. I would say that now I would compare the situation after September 2023 in negotiation protests uh, with the situation which emerged after failed Kazan summit of 2011 without going too much into details what happened in Kazan, just to say that after three years of intensive negotiations, mediated mostly by Russian then-President Dmitry Medvedev, but supported by the United States and France, there was a document agreed by Armenia and Azerbaijan and co-chairs, which was going to be signed in Kazan in June 2011, based on Madrid principles. But at the last moment, in the Kazan itself, President Aliyev declined to sign the document. Then we have the negotiations. After Kazan, you may recall meeting between Serzhak and Ilham Aliyev, 
between me and Sergio Foreign Affairs. We had several meetings, but simultaneously, Azerbaijan started to escalate since summer 2014. Then we had April 4th war in 2016. Then we have Velvet Revolution, change of government, again, meetings between Pashinyan and Aliyev. But it was clear, immediately starting from 2011, that there is no real negotiations. This is just a ticking box exercises, and escalation is coming. So limited escalation came in summer 2014, then in April 2016, then large-scale escalation came in 2020. So my understanding is that now the negotiation process is in the same situation as what after Kazan, but because currently, due to the global and regional changes of geopolitical uh, events or developments are much quicker than in the period of 2011-2020, I guess we will not wait for nine years until a new large-scale escalation. It will take much less. But uh, logic is the same. Imitation of negotiations while Azerbaijan is preparing to realize their 106-year-old dream of Azerbaijan and Turkey to establish direct land border. And this can be done only by taking parts of Armenian territories. Of course, it does not mean that automatically they should succeed. And there are different factors which preventing this to happen. Otherwise, Azerbaijani army will be in Sunik or Bayodor ordered in February or March 2024. But this is a strategic goal. So no peace agreement. Weakening Armenia is a minimum goal. Uh, taking southern part of Armenia and making Armenia as Azerbaijan in Turkish client state is a long-term goal. Benny, I mean, you talked about a, a very weak Armenia. Since the high-level U.S.-EU-Armenia meeting, U.S. Ambassador Christina Queen said in a recent interview that the U.S. and Armenia have very active defense and security cooperation. This goes a little beyond the previously released boosting Armenia's resilience statements after the meeting. And at the same time, let me also mention that the Armenian government has announced that it will appoint a defense attaché to its London embassy. Are there serious collaborations going on that are not transparent to the people of Armenia, or are these all PR statements to boost support for Pashinyan's government? Of course, I think no one of us, at least three of us, we do not have full access to the information or to the closed-door negotiations, and definitely we have no possibility to have access to this information. So it's like, it's uh, complicated to argue like, okay, I know for pretty sure that there is something or there is nothing, but my understanding, my perception, or even I will say my intuition tells that I don't believe there could be any large-scale military and defense cooperation between Armenia and United States. Yes, we had this uh, military training immediately before uh, September 2023 military takeover of Nagorno-Karabakh. I think it was in early September 2023. Potentially, some sort of joint small-scale military drills may happen in 2024. If we're speaking about Armenia-US cooperation on peacekeeping, it started back in 2004, starting from 2004, including all 14 years First under Robert Kocharian and then under Serge Sarkisian, Armenian and U.S. were cooperating to increase Armenian peacekeeping uh, capacities and uh, capabilities. Then I believe the ambassador, I mean U.S. ambassador to Armenia said that the United States will give us some armored ambulance vehicles. Yeah. Maybe there will be something else. But again, I will be very much surprised. Again, as I mentioned, we don't have full information and we cannot have full information what is being discussed, what is going on behind the closed doors, but uh, I would say my intuition and our understanding of the situation and also the trends gives me the perception that to say that, okay, Armenia and the United States are going to launch large-scale defense cooperation, which will include, for example, the supply of more or less modern U.S. weapons to Armenia in large quantities, which can very quickly and significantly change the balance of power between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Okay, I would be very happy to see that, but uh, I think its probability is quite low. And on Armenia-EU relations, we all know that uh, most probably in upcoming months, a new document will be signed, so-called New Partnership Agenda, which will not cancel the SEPA. It will be something like addition to SEPA. It will not be also the association agreement, uh, which, for example, Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova signed in 2014, which include free trade area, because Armenia is a part of the Eurasian Economic Union, so it will be something like in enhanced SEPA, let's put it this way. And this new partnership agenda also will have several pillars. Among them, it will be also this security pillar. But again, 
and now discussions are on the way to provide Armenian no lethal support on European peace facility. Again, I don't know how much support it will be or what kind of support we are speaking about, but it's clear that the European Union is ready to provide non-lethal support. I'm not a military expert, but non-lethal support means not weapons. Is there any reason to believe that Armenia's desire to remove Russia from the border guard duties, for example, in Zvartnorts airport, but perhaps everywhere else as well, may be related to the desire to import Western defense resources into the country? I don't think so, because, for example, France started to supply some weapons to Armenia, and Russians are there, and I don't think that, at least, first, I don't believe that this is a requirement from technical or legal point of view. And frankly speaking, also, I don't believe that, for example, France told us that, okay, if you want to receive Armenian weapons, there should be no Armenian border troops in Zvartnot or no Armenian border troops along Armenia-Turkey or Armenia-Iran border, because what's Russian border troops along Armenia-Turkey and Armenia-Iran border? Well, so um, those APCs, the Bastion APCs that were provided by France, we've all talked about that, that they were kind of a show. They're not like a, a major factor in defense or anything. But when we're talking about certain defense capabilities, which we've heard that uh, the, the NATO countries are very worried about the technology falling into Russian hands. I'm trying to see if uh, within that context, there is a reason why, you know, somebody has told the Armenian government, get the Russians out of the way. Okay, if you are speaking about uh, the potential sensitive technology, and here I can yeah. fully understand the West, also, frankly speaking, a lot of more or less sensitive technology already Russians have, because they took a lot of arms or weaponry which West provided to Ukraine. But in any case, I here I may understand uh, West's concerns, mm -hmm. but to say that the only way for Russia to have access to some technologies will appear in Armenia, the only way is through Russian border troops or Russian military base? No, like it's, it's ridiculous because we all understand that uh, the great powers, they have uh, different networks of influence in different countries, including in countries like Armenia. Uh, so to argue that, okay, if there will be no Russian border troops in Armenia, then Russia will have zero possibilities, opportunities to have access to some uh, sensitive technologies. No, it's, that does not make any sense. I mean, you cannot kick out Russian military base from Armenia. You may kick out Russian border troops with Armenia, but still Russia will have some sort of network which will allow Russia to have access to some sensitive technology. And frankly speaking, I even I will be surprised. Like, who is going to provide the high-level sensitive technology to Armenia? European Union as an organization, we are speaking about only non-lethal support. It's very clear that whatever will is going to be done through European Peace Facility, it will be non-lethal support. And I don't think that the non-lethal support will be too technologically sensitive. Okay. If we are speaking about United States, zero chances. France, uh, let's see. But again, it does not directly, at least I will not relate it directly to presence of Russian military base or border troops. So, uh, Benjamin, over the weekend, we read in an exclusive expose in the Times that the UK would like Armenia to sign an agreement similar to what they have signed with Rwanda to accept uh, their illegal immigrants. The Times mentioned that Armenia began these negotiations last September. But we also know that sometime in November, Armenia was visited by a high-ranking delegation from the UK in order to begin, quote, strategic dialogue, unquote, discussions with Armenia. And the Armenian Ministry of Foreign Affairs essentially did not deny that this topic has been discussed in the past. They said that there is nothing concrete, you know, we, there is nothing technical, but it was a essentially a confirmation in the form of a denial, in my opinion. Have you read this story? What are your uh, impressions? What is the danger of this type of deal? And is it a good idea for Armenia even to pretend? You know, I'm assuming, let's say, some people are saying that, well, it's okay for Armenia to negotiate this as long as they don't go through with it finally. But is it a good idea for Armenia to even pretend to be interested in this type of a uh, deal? Frankly speaking, now I have to use I have to use the term weird second time during the <laughs> show, but it was weird to see Armenia among the countries like Botswana or, I don't know, like Costa Cote Rica, then some yeah. Cote d'Ivoire, then some other African countries. Like, I'm really surprised, like, uh, why Armenia? Like, even from UK perspective, why is they thought that Armenia may be a place for illegal immigrants? Yes, of course, US, UK is ready to pay money, but let's not forget that uh, we are speaking about uh, people from completely different culture and religions and 
Armenia because mostly these illegal immigrants, they are either from Middle East or from Africa. As it's most uh, people, they lack basic education. Probably they have been forced to be involved in many criminal activities. I'm not blaming these people because if you are immigrant, if you are a refugee, your country is destroyed and you and your family are starving. No one can blame them if they were involved in some criminal activities or whatever. But ideas that, okay, let's bring this into Armenia. And the problem was, if I understand this also, this paper correctly, that initially the European Court of Human Rights blocked the agreement with Rwanda, telling that, okay, but if then Rwanda will send these migrants to other third countries, then they may be persecuted, they may be tortured, etc., etc. And then the revised agreement with Rwanda means that Rwanda is not able to send these immigrants to anywhere else except back to United Kingdom, which means that in theory, you can have thousands or tens of thousands of people coming to Armenia, a small country with a lot of problems, and they may stay here for, I don't know, for months, it's for years. So first, it's very weird that Armenia is part of the discussion, and I really don't understand how why UK decided that among some Latin American and African countries, also Armenia should be even approached. But uh, yes, uh, MFA didn't uh, reject the negotiations. They said there was no technical detailed negotiations or whatever. Uh, potentially, our government thought that, okay, this is a, some way to get some leverage or something for UK, because we all know that the United Kingdom is the biggest investor in Azerbaijan, like tens of billions of dollars, or I think more than $30 billion BP or even up to $40 billion BP yes, was invested yes. in Azerbaijan. I guess it was even more than $40 billion. Maybe our government thought that, okay, UK is an influential player because of Azerbaijani oil and gas, they are fully supporting Azerbaijan. So how we can get something in the UK so they don't 100% support Azerbaijan, but 90% Azerbaijan, 10% Armenia, like what we can offer UK, telling them, okay, you have financial interest in Azerbaijan, so you are fully supporting Azerbaijan. Okay, how we can create some interest in UK? Maybe they thought that, okay, let's offer UK that uh, we can uh, accept part of your illegal immigrants, and somehow this will leverage UK interests in Azerbaijan, I mean financial oil, gas interests. Uh, this yeah. could be the only reasonable explanation which I, I can find, but still, uh, to see our meaning in this list of countries, and even to believe that, for example, if Armenia for some amount of money, I don't remember, it was like 40,000 US dollars per one migrant or even 100,000 US dollars for one migrant, if Armenia will start to receive... I think I read something migrants. on the order of 150,000. Yes, or even uh, I think 150,000. I can't remember if yeah. it was dollars or pounds. Yeah. But uh, to believe that even if Armenia will start to receive illegal immigrants with United Kingdom, this will enough leverage to balance the UK policy in South Caucasus or it'll somehow make UK neutral between Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, no, I don't think so that uh, this in any way can reach that goal, if the goal yeah. was that. But again, I see only reason, one only reasonable goal, except like to simply earn money, which is will be even double weird to earn money in this type of activities. Yeah, I have to... Uh, uh... You know, I have to join your uh, statement and add my own weirdness <laughs> or weird uh, feeling to this. But my question is, why are we hearing about this from leaks in UK press and not from the government of Armenia? I mean, this is the bastion of democracy, as they say. So why couldn't the Armenian government be honest with its people and say that, yes, we're discussing this? And, you know, the, the, the things that you mentioned, like, you know, if if the influx of refugees or deportees from UK is in any significant number, then this has huge security implications for Armenia, huge sovereignty even implications, I would say. So I just, it, does, it seems weird that a country talking about sovereignty, about uh, democracy is keeping this hidden from its own people and uh, potentially doing moves that could threaten that sovereignty that they're talking about. Okay, my understanding is that government has or had a feeling that uh, this will not be welcomed by a majority of Armenian population. That is why they didn't tell about it. And this government uh, has a quite long history of not telling something which is going to happen or not telling what they thought. Because, for example, just very recently, the Prime Minister stated that, okay, Nagorno-Karabakh or Nagorno-Karabakh issue was something like a necklace put on Armenian neck by Russia or by 
whatever a leash to, a leash a leash yes it was a leash put on armenia's uh, neck to prevent this development or keep it close to russia but uh, for example in 2018 immediately when he was elected as a prime minister then during 2018 campaign and even for example during 2020 war when prime minister was using facebook live calling armenians to self organize and go and fight in karabakh because this is a second sardarabakh this is our homeland and also during 2021 election campaign he didn't say that okay guys uh, nagorno karabakh is a leash and is this should be destroyed armenia to be free because he understood that most probably majority of population will not support these views. So from this perspective, I am not surprised because most probably there was a feeling that the idea that like hundreds or thousands or even tens of thousands illegal immigrants or deportees, mostly from Africa, can come to Armenia for whatever reason, this will not be welcomed by populations. That is why they didn't disclose it. At uh, least, Benjamin, uh, just to put it in perspective... The, the numbers that we are talking about that are a problem for the, the UK are on the order of between 500,000 and 750,000 migrants to the UK. Now, not all of those would be agreed with Armenia, obviously, but um, they're trying to solve a problem for themselves. And they're trying to basically find the countries that are willing to even discuss this. A lot of countries have just basically rejected it and said, we will not talk about this stuff. Yeah. And, also, let's not forget also, that it's not only about UK, but many other countries have this problem. For example, course. in the same paper, it was written that Italy is now negotiating with Albania. So any country which will say, okay, give me money and I'm ready to accept even uh, part of your illegal immigrants, this may open the Pandora docks. Then uh, other countries, mostly European, of course, can come to Armenia and say, okay, if uh, you agree to accept, like, I don't know, a few thousand from UK, for this amount of money, then you may accept, I don't know, a few thousand from Italy, a few thousand from Spain. Why not? Exactly. Uh, and Benjamin, the, the way that you phrase it is also very worrisome in that Armenia is basically forced to do this in order to get on the good side of the UK, which basically means that there is a lot of leverage uh, and Armenia right now is starved of security. So any country that would be willing to throw a little bit of security our way means that we would accept all these res refugees and all this uh coincidence you know i mean this is like uh this is coincidental right now but you know armenia assigning a defense attache to the uk this strategic dialogue uh between the U uk and armenia all of this seems uh to be too coincidental to be random chance so the way I see it is that the UK prime minister made big promises to solve their immigration problems, and now he's desperate for any means that can pull him out of it. So is it possible that the UK is trying to take advantage of an extremely weak Armenia by conditioning any security or so-called strategic cooperation on Armenia's acquiescence to accept the UK's illegal migrants? Uh, I don't exclude that um, the UK would try or maybe even tried to make this, uh, like uh, in the negotiations, they simply may say, okay, let's put into our strategic cooperation framework or strategic dialogue framework also issues about illegal immigration. From negotiation point of view, definitely, I thought that first UK will say, okay, but what about, okay, you want strategic dialogue? Strategic dialogue should be about different areas. Like, let's structure our strategic dialogue, different themes. And what about having... A strategic dialogue also about illegal immigration. Probably the Armenian government at the beginning said, okay, yes, why not? Like illegal, illegal immigration. Yes, it's not a too big issue for Armenia, but in any case, uh, yes, let's do illegal immigration as one of the potential pillar of strategic dialogue. And then when you say yes, then UK will say, okay, if because this is a, or this is may become, or this can become a part of our strategic dialogue, then okay, uh, let's start to think, okay, how we can support each other on illegal immigration. Maybe UK can support Armenia, like give some money to increase your border capacities, border service, border troops capacities, or bring some additional technical devices, technical equipments into your border crossing points with Georgia, with Iran, or whatever. This will be our support. And what will be your support to us? Okay, we have this problem. And for example, what is it possible that Armenia will receive few thousand migrants and we are ready to pay, I don't know, 100 or 150,000 US dollars or pounds. 
uh, for each uh, migrant. These type of discussions, I will not be surprised if they took place. Hovig, let's just take a moment here. We'd like to remind everyone to go to our donate page, podcasts.groom.org slash donate, and consider buying us a coffee or two, or better yet, become a sustaining member of Groom and give monthly. You know, we like to believe that we are unique in the category of Armenian podcasts. We digest Armenian news weekly and bring you interesting discussions relevant to it. We've always been a labor of love, and we're not only nonprofit, but we're also non-budget. Just two to three friends who have committed our life's time and effort to understand the world around Armenians and sharing that understanding with you. Of course, we will continue our work as we always have, but we are stronger with you than without you. Your support will help us expand our reach to more people who are interested in Armenian news and affairs around the world. So please visit our donate page, podcasts.groom.org slash donate and consider supporting us. Thank you in advance. We appreciate your listening to us and take that trust and your support very seriously. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me turn our attention to Iran for a moment. Over the weekend, Iran launched a large wave of drones coupled with ballistic missiles against Israel, marking the first time that Iran has used its own territory in such an attack. It's important to highlight that Iran said its actions were in response to Israel's attack on the Iranian consulate in Syria, This happened on um, April 1st, I believe, which resulted in deaths of military leadership in the consulate. At the same time, Iran had telegraphed its activities for a couple of weeks. Iran gave plenty of notice of this very slow-moving massive attack that took place, which, um, according to CNN, took five hours to journey from Iran to Israel over Iraqi and Jordanian airspace. Israel claims that hardly any damage was done to targets within the country, while Iranian sources claim that despite support from U.S., British, and Jordanian air defenses, Iranian missiles were able to penetrate highly sensitive military targets in Israel. Benny, I mean, my question is, how serious was this retaliation by Iran? Was this more of a message or a military operation designed to cause damage in Israel? Uh, Definitely, this was a message. And the symbolic message and the symbolism is that Iran shows that Iran is ready to hit Israel from its own territory. So for many people, this was something like a red line. And also there was an understanding that Iran mostly using proxy uh, forces to fight its wars. And Iran had a lot of proxies in the Middle East. So this was a message that, okay, Iran is also ready to use its own territory. But that's far as I understand, and also according to international media and some military experts, Iran mostly didn't use its more advanced weapons, including uh, more advanced ballistic or cruise missiles, which means that uh, the idea was not to put real uh, harm or damage to Israel. And even Iranians said that uh, they warned neighboring countries, which means they warned also Israel, even indirectly in the United States, about the tech like 48 or even 72 hours prior to the attack. So right. here's the key thing was the message that the guys, one more like psychological red line was passed. Psychological red line that Iran will not dare attack Israel from its territory. So uh, this was a message and also what Iran is, is now doing, they are telling that if Israel will retaliate, Iranian's response will be tougher. So now Israel in a very complicated situation because yes, Israel may launch strikes against Iranian proxies on Syria and Iraq, which Israel is doing in the last several years. Almost on a weekly basis, we hear information about Israeli air forces bombing Iran-connected forces in Syria and Iraq. But psychologically and symbolically, if Israel launches attacks not directly to the Iranian territory, but attacks against Iran-connected forces in Syria and Iraq, this will be also the psychological victory for Iran because it, it perceives that Iran dared to hit Israel from its own territory, but Israel did not dare to hit Iran territory from its own from its own territory. And Israel hit only Syrian and uh, Iraqi territory. So I think this is a very well calculated game and also sending message that if there will be retaliation of Israel against Iranian territory, Iran is ready to significantly escalate. This is also a message to the United States because my understanding is that the last thing which President Biden or Biden administration wants in a situation when there is only six months prior to the presidential 
elections to have another big war or come back to the as Americans are uh, calling them uh, wars with no end or no clear end or end, endless wars in the Middle East. Because if Israel attacks Iran and Iran escalates, then Israel will escalate and this may bring United States into much bigger war in the Middle East and even two Iraqi wars, 1991 and then 2003 occupation of Iraq, which continued for years and years until 2011, I believe, or this 20 years long war in Afghanistan. So what do you think, by the way? Do you believe that Israel will retaliate? Let's put it this way. From Prime Minister Netanyahu perspective, probably, okay, Israel will retaliate. Key question is this, will Israel hit Iranian territory or it will hit Iran-connected forces in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, or anywhere else. From Netanyahu perspective, who definitely needs continuation of the war as a way to boost its credentials and keep his position as a prime minister. And let's not forget that he has also the personal interest because uh, criminal cases on corruption are still there and simply uh, trials have been stopped because prime minister has some sort of immunity in Israel. So from a narrow perspective, political and personal perspective of Netanyahu, maybe he will be interested to escalate more, hitting directly Iranian territory. As far as I understand, U.S. interest, U.S. should do everything to prevent any Israeli attack against Iranian territory. But if at the end of the day, Israel only attacks Syria, Yemen, or Iraq, then psychologically it will be Iran's victory. Because many in the region will say, okay, what is an interesting situation? Iran hits Israel directly from Iranian territory to Israel territory. Israel uh, hits from its territory only to Iranian proxies outside Iran, which means that people will say, okay, this is another like proof that the balance of power is gradually changing. So let's see. But again, from my perspective, US will do everything to prevent large scale escalation and another endless war, especially six or seven months before elections. But yeah, I mean, um, besides the red lines that uh, you know you you mentioned that uh, Iran showed that it was able, to, uh, willing and able to cross, there are various analyses of this attack from a perspective of the the technique of launching massively these large amount of drones and then almost simultaneously following up with ballistic missiles, and, and the expense that the you know Israel and its allies used to take these down. So there's some estimations that it cost Israel, US, UK, and so forth, all of them combined, uh, more than a billion dollars, just in terms of the number of missiles that they had to use to shoot down these relatively cheap drones, which are, I believe, you know, several thousand to like tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, Do you believe that this is also a qualitative signal that Iran sent Essentially, this is asymmetric in the perspective of, you know, how much it costs for Iran to fight versus how much it costs Israel to fight. It could be because from cost-benefit analysis, yes, there were estimates that the pure cost of missiles, which all Israel and its allies spent, was something like 1.3 billion US dollars. At least I saw that number. And definitely it's multiple times bigger the number than the number which Iran spent. So it could be that also this is a message from Iran said yes, uh, maybe due to the 44 year or uh, 45 years of sanctions, the Islamic revolution, Iran's economy is in a better, not in excellent shape, and definitely Iran cannot compete by the wealth with Israel and definitely cannot compete with the United States. But maybe, yes, I would agree that it also was a message that, okay, guys, I can spend 50 million and I can force you to spend more than 1 billion. So, yes. Your budget is much bigger than my budget, but also take into account to this. I do not exclude, at least uh, this is quite logical, that also message was this, that, okay, don't think that because you are much wealthier than me or you can spend on your defense much more money than me, it automatically means that uh, you always will have an advantage. Yeah. Uh, The Armenian angle in all this is also very interesting. Iran continues to warn the Armenian government against turning the country into a geopolitical football field for non-regional powers. I want to know, is Iran too busy with Israel to defend its red lines in the South Caucasus, Benjamin? Uh, You are right. On uh, April 16th, the Iranian ambassador to Armenia had a press conference in uh, Yerevan and he reiterated that region should not be part of geopolitical games, reiterated that Iran will not tolerate changes to international recognized borders. As of now, 
I don't believe that Iran is too busy in Middle East to say that the deterrence factor, and Iran is the number one deterring factor against large-scale Azerbaijani aggressions against Armenia to take a part of uh, Sunni or whole of Sunni or part of Ayodzor and reach Turkey, Nakhijawan and then via Nakhijawan, Turkey. I don't believe that currently we can say that this deterring factor went down. But if, big if, there will be direct and really large-scale Israel-Iran war, which automatically means also U.S.-Iran war, then I'm afraid we can say that Iran's capacity and capability to deter Azerbaijani aggression against Armenia will be extremely restricted or limited, uh, which, of course, uh, will raise the possibilities of Azerbaijani large-scale attack. Is the northern border part of that front against Iran that Israel can create? In which case, the Iran-Azerbaijan border is going to become extremely problematic, probably the same as the Iran-Armenia border. According to several estimates, Israeli security services and military intelligence have already been deployed in the territories which Azerbaijan took from Nagorno-Karabakh Republic during 2020 war. Mm -hmm. I mean, this 170 kilometer of former Nagorno-Karabakh Republic Iran border, like Fizuli, Zangelan, etc. And uh, it's not coincidence that while there is a zero civilian population in these areas, Azerbaijan already opened two airports, Fizuli and Zangelan airports, deployed very close to the Iran border. And also Azerbaijan opened several so-called smart villages with fully Israeli technologies, again, very close to Azerbaijan-Iran border. So Israel already is using Azerbaijani territory for some anti, anti-Iranian activities, but I think the real danger for Azerbaijan will be if, in case of large-scale escalation, Israel will use Azerbaijani territory for kinetic attack, because it's one thing like to establish some, I don't know, reconnaissance or some cyber or recording devices or equipment in Azerbaijani territory close to Iranian border and to monitor Iranian territory, this is one thing, but directly use Azerbaijani airspace or Azerbaijani territory for kinetic attack against Iran is a different thing. But as far as I understand, uh, Azerbaijani current leadership, they are smart enough uh, not to allow that. Uh, they may allow that if they will be provided by 100% guarantees that as a result of the war, there will be regime change in Iran. So Azerbaijan uh, will suffer, but at the end of the day, current Iranian state will be destroyed and Azerbaijan will be victorious. But I think it's too risky. At least if I was a person sitting in Baku, I would not agree to allow my territory or airspace to be used for kinetic attack against Iran by Israel. Benjamin, yeah, I mean, uh, if you, if, how about if you're a person sitting in Yerevan, how would you react to the potential escalation of this conflict? Uh, and what I mean is, uh, is the current strategy that Armenia is employing? Obviously, we talked. We talked about it. Uh, Iran is not pleased, but should Armenia try to take advantage of the situation and score more points with Iran, or essentially try to remain neutral and a silent observer? What What would you advise um, the Armenian government? Uh, potentially, one that would listen to you, obviously. Okay, two things. Uh, as of now, yes, to say to call everybody to kill more or less calm, to emphasize that uh, we are um, condemning uh, any threat or uh, use of force or et cetera, et cetera. But as a continuously planning, because definitely we cannot be sure that the situation will not be escalated in a way that Iran deterrence factor will be diminished or maybe even uh, fully became zero. I mean, Iran's deterrence factor against Azerbaijani attack, I would look forward that, okay, if, let's assume, Iran is not a deterrent factor, what to do to still prevent Azerbaijani aggression? Here, I would try, at least I would stop uh, any efforts, actions, or steps which may further deteriorate Armenia-Russia relations. Because if there are chances that the number one deterrent factor, which is Iran, is, maybe go down, then uh, we should stop this going down process of Armenia-Russia relations, trying to somehow increase Russian deterrence factor against Azerbaijani attack, and simultaneously also work with the West to try to get some messages from the West to Azerbaijan that 
sanctions against President Aliyev and his family are imminent and inevitable if Azerbaijan launches a large-scale attack against Armenia. Because currently, as far as I see, there are three factors preventing Azerbaijan large-scale attack against Armenia. One factor is a COP29, but after November 2024, it will expire. There will be no such an factor. Additional three factors, uh, which will continue after November 2024, is first, potential Iranian military intervention. Second, strategic ambiguity regarding Russia's actions. Russia may do nothing, Russia may do something, but strategic ambiguity is a deterrent factor. And third, even Western economic sanctions on Azerbaijani oil and gas sector and President Aliyev family. So if uh, there are these three main factors, because again, the COP29 uh, will be in place until November or until December 2024, then definitely Armenia would have contingency plans. What if from these three factors, Iranian factor is going down? Will be these two factors be enough? Maybe we need uh, some contingency plans to replace Iranian factor or, or at least to increase the remaining two. Because if for whatever reason, Iranian factor is out and it's very difficult to find another absolutely new deterring factor against Azerbaijani attacks, then Armenia should do everything to increase the two remaining factors, Russia and the economic sanction by the West. Right. So in Armenia, the so-called bastion of democracy, two political prisoner cases made the news this week. Let's briefly talk about them. First is the Armen Ashutian case. So Armen Ashutian has been in pretrial detention for many months now. And the uh, court essentially extended his pretrial detention for another three months. And this is related to misuse of position. We'll talk more in detail about these cases uh, in general with a human rights expert. But from my understanding, it is very questionable. And this case has been criticized by international organizations such as the IDC CDI, which has condemned Ashutian's detention, calling it politically motivated. The European People's Party has also spoken out of, against Ashutian's detention and said that the case lacks substantial evidence. Meanwhile, the entire Armenian opposition, uh, parliamentary opposition, was in the courtroom that day to offer their personal guarantees. Essentially, they're putting themselves at risk for being criminally responsible uh, in order to guarantee Ashutian's release, at least during this trial period, to no avail. And we of, of course, we know uh, what happens to pro-government people who are in trial and uh, the court promptly releases them. For instance, uh, Alain Simonian's sister-in-law, uh, after all of civil contract members wrote a letter to the judge, uh, basically she was released, even though the sums, the, the amounts involved in her case are pretty high. So it was a pretty serious corruption case. Anyway. The next case this week uh, that happened this week was Narek Malian's case. Uh, on Friday, uh, a court of first instance in Yerevan found Narek Malian uh, to be guilty in engaging public calls for violence. Malian has been in pretrial detention since last September, and he will serve another five months and seven days behind bars, all for something that he said on Facebook. And this was completely... Uh, non-specific. He said, you know, oh, we'll go to the homes of these uh, civil contract members and have coffee with them or something like that. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Nikol Pashinyan's newspaper today published an article where they explicitly called out, uh, you know, they explicitly issued threats against uh, opposition, saying that they will um, resort to beating them up or killing them if the police doesn't take any action in curbing the opposition. Um, and also another thing that's interesting in the Malian case was that the key evidence used to prosecute him appears to have been edited and presented out of context, and the original evidence was never presented in court. Such is the justice in Armenia if you're an opposition member. So Benjamin, Ashotians and Malian's cases are the most prominent for opposition members uh, being jailed amidst allegations of political motivation. Do you believe that the Pashinyan regime is prosecuting opposition members in a politically motivated manner? I would say that political prisoners in 2024 in a country which officially is stating its intentions to come as close to the EU as uh, possible or as EU is ready and speaking about European aspirations and etc. This is absolutely unacceptable. This is first. 
Second, this is damaging uh, Armenia, definitely. Yes, we may say that, okay, but democracy itself is something not, not important. The democracy is being used. There is a double standard. It's a geopolitical tool. And mostly I, I will agree. But at the end of the day, the rule of law is good for Armenia and good for Armenian people. I mean, I don't push this idea that, okay, we should have rule of law or we should not we should not have political prisoners because Europe wants that or someone sitting in White House wants that or someone sitting in Washington wants that. No, we should not have political prisoners because this is good for our Armenia itself, regardless what Europe thinks or whatever thing. So this is damaging. This is damaging, first of all, us. But also this will damage our international standing because regardless of the fact that, yes, mostly now democracy is um, being used as a geopolitical tool to put pressure on countries, but still, it's something. It's it's a factor. So this is bad for Armenia inside. This could be bad for Armenia outside. And this is absolutely unacceptable. All right. Let's wrap up our topics here. And let me ask each of you if you have something you would like to share with our listeners. Hovik, what's on your mind? Yeah, just that, you know, we know that we have a lot of the diplomatic corps in Armenia, foreign diplomatic corps, listening to us. I would just like to remind that after the 2016 events and even before the 2008 events, foreign diplomats were hounding Armenian officials. And this was also mentioned earlier this week by Nayera Zohrabian. You know, Svitovsky, who was the EU representative at the time, used to call her every occasion and ask explicitly to provide an explanation about political prisoners. He used to attend the trials himself, many of the trials of the detainees that the EU considered political so I would just like to ask you, if you're a Western diplomat, maybe, just maybe, you should consider attending one of these trials and asking representatives, asking your counterparts in Armenia more questions about the status of these prisoners and why Armenia still has political prisoners today. Yeah. Benjamin, something on your mind you'd like to share? Uh, yes, like we are, I guess, approximately one week or exactly one week before the Armenian genocide, uh, another 109 anniversary. And I would say that regardless who is telling what, for whatever reasons, government, international community, Turkey, or whatever else, we should not forget. But not only we should not forget, but we also should take lessons and we should be prepared for future to prevent these type of things. Unfortunately, we failed to do this. Because apparently in Nagorno-Karabakh, we saw the same as what happened in uh, Ottoman Empire. You can even compare the photos. Yes, people were fleeing from Nagorno-Karabakh using cars, and they were not on the foods, on their own food. But essentially, this was more or less the same tactic. We, again, lost some part of our homeland. So let's be more vigilant to get lessons from the history and to prevent this like immediately non-stopping process because at the end of the day this will hurt any of us like if someone thinks that okay i'm living in yerevan i don't care or now we live in globalized world i could take plane and fly to russia without visas or i have i don't know 10 year multi-us visa i may went to new york or whatever and i don't care what happening no this will hunt and hurt every are Armenian. We should understand this. We should take lessons and we should move forward. Yeah, we've definitely had a couple of very surreal topics here on this show. And I guess we live in surreal times with this government. Uh, on my part, I'd also like to share something. Last Friday, a military truck had an accident and killed four and injured 20 Armenian servicemen. There was barely a peep out of the government media about this, as usual, a short nondescript article and pretty much no follow-up. The Ministry of Defense said that there will be a full investigation and criminal probe against the driver. The cynical in me says, oh, this is so much improved over last year when 15 of our servicemen burned in their military barracks. But the sad truth is that this government has not taken responsibility for that incident 15 months ago. That was, I think, January 19 of 2023. There has been no political accountability for the constant failures which are costing our soldiers their lives. All I can say is, people, don't hold your breath. Don't expect answers from this government. They don't care about Armenian lives. 
and I'm sure I speak for each of us on this podcast when I say we are deeply sorry and concerned for the injured soldiers and offer our condolences to the families of those who gave their lives in service of our homeland. May they rest in peace. Indeed. Indeed. Amen. Okay. Well, on that note, let's leave it there for today. Thank you, Benjamin, for joining us as usual. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, Aspet. Thank you, Hobik, for having me. Please remember to support us. Go to our donate page, podcasts.groom.org slash donate, and consider buying us a coffee or better yet, become a sustaining member of Groom and give monthly. Thank you in advance. Okay, that was our show recorded on April 16, 2024. We've been talking with Dr. Benjamin Boosian, who is a senior fellow at APRI Armenia, a Yerevan-based think tank. He's also the chairman of the Center for Political and Economic Strategic Studies. I'm Aspet Bedrosian. And this is Hovik Manucharyan. Please follow us on social media and follow us everywhere you get your Armenian news. The links are in the show notes. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you soon.